and welcome back to Movement Matters. I'm your host and physical therapist, Christine Linders. In this episode, we'll be discussing stress reduction solutions with Devin Bernor, licensed professional counselor. But before we begin, I'd like to ask you, do you ever feel like you're getting forgetful? When I'm stressed, I do. The reason is because chronic worry and stress actually alters our brain chemistry and affects our ability to learn, think, and remember. To help solve this problem, let's go to video number one. Nowadays, there are many things pulling on each one of ours attention, whether it's home stresses, work stresses, the pandemic, homeschooling, you name it, our cell phones, emails, all the things that we have to correspond to. There's a lot more taxing on us and it's very important to find calm to get through your day and so that you can be there for your family, love more freely, work better and enjoy your life. So I go through a guided meditation, which really helps me to get my mind off of what I'm stressed about. So I'm going to take you through one. You don't have to sit with the beach in there, even if you just go to a room in your house and shut the door or wash your hands in the sink, focus on the slipperiness of the soap, the temperature of the water, take your mind and focus it on one thing so that it takes your mind off of what's bothering you. So you can sit or lay down. I'm gonna sit right here. And I'm gonna take a deep breath in. And I'm gonna take a deep breath out. Deep breath in. High and deep breath out. If there's something on your mind that's bothering you, deep breath in. Exhale and let it go. If you feel tension in your shoulders, deep breath in. Tense. Deep breath all the way out, let it go. If you can't stop your mind from wandering, that's okay. Think about one word or the word one. Deep breath in. Exhale out your mouth. One. Think about the word one. Deep breath in. Exhale. When we're stressed chronically, uh, the hormone cortisol is released too much in our system and that creates us wreaks havoc on our body. We can have stomach troubles. You can age yourself, gain weight, be unable to sleep. And when we're happy, it releases other hormones and endorphins that make us feel happy. So when you're chronically stressed, it changes your brain chemistry and not for the better. When you can find calm, it changes your brain chemistry and the brain organs so you can feel better. You can think more clearly. You can operate better and be happier. Enjoy. Now I'd like to welcome Devin, who's visiting us here from Colorado. Aloha. Devin, let's talk a bit about stress and its effect on digestion, sleep quality, aging, and even weight gain. Woohoo, let's do it. <laughs> um, do you do anything like that? Or when you're working or counseling people, do you go through any kind of uh, how to find calm, how to center yourself, how to hone in your mind or get control? <laughs> do. I practice mindfulness and I also do progressive muscle relaxation. In particular, I'm a huge fan of mindfulness walks. So I live, um, I live in a really gorgeous area of Colorado and there's trails all around me. So just like what you were talking about of feeling the slipperiness of the soap and focusing on one thing, you can do that when you take walks as well. And it's one of the most relaxing, grounding and centering activities you can do feeling the wind on your body, noticing the sounds around you, staying in yourself and not letting yourself get caught up in what your mind is doing. And just like what you said about letting the thoughts come in, you also can picture your thoughts that kind of zoom into your mind where you start ruminating on something that's bothering you, like a passing car. It kind of flies through, but you don't hold on to it. Just let it go and keep going. So it's, it's definitely a nice relaxing way to deal with things. I like that. I, during the pandemic, I was taking walks every morning. We were off for about three weeks and I made an effort to get up every morning and take a walk. And I swear those days were the days that I felt the best or the most 
the most calm. I had a lot of things to do because we were working from home and trying to do some internet things and social media things that were new for me. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I got up, I took that walk. It was only like a 15 minute walk and I came back a different human being. <laughs> Ground yourself and center yourself. <laughs> I did, I did. So what kind of tips do you have for trying to come up with a coping strategy? Let's say you've been so stressed. Like I had a period where I was super, super stressed out and it was all the time. And I was just trying to like, okay, I'm just gonna take a breath and I'm just gonna exhale. And I'm gonna do like what I did in that video. I'm gonna think about the word one and only the word one. And I'm gonna think about the O, the N and the E, you know, and just to focus on one point that wasn't all these things that were calling my attention. Do you have other tips for if you have to be in a place and you can't get for that walk, whether it's in your car, at your desk, with your kids running around, all of that? Yeah, well, so I have two jobs and I have kids and the pandemic was, horrific for us. I think I was doing eight hours of counseling a day in my freezing cold basement. So, <laughs> and I also do a lot of public speaking. Um, so getting up in front of 200 people and saying whatever it is you have to say can be extremely anxiety provoking. And at first it was a huge struggle for me. And so a lot of the symptoms of stress, which can be useful, stress is a, a thing we can harness and use for good, but we can talk about that later. Before I would get up to public speak, my heart would race. I would get lightheaded and dizzy. I would get my sweaty palms, all that other good stuff. So sitting down and doing deep breathing. Deep breathing is the best skill you'll ever have in your pocket. Just like from the mindfulness video, but everybody has a different pattern. So you have to figure out what pattern works for you. For me, it's in for four, hold for two, and out for eight. So it looks like this. I recommend doing at least 10 rounds. <laughs> it's I feel a lot. relaxed even doing that. I was trying to, I don't know, I think I heard you in for whatever you go in, you're double it and triple it. And I couldn't do that. I like your in for four, hold for two, out for eight. And then you expel all that carbon dioxide, right? And the H so you can breathe That's in like oxygen. There's even another layer of science that I find extremely interesting. So if, and sometimes for men, it might be better to do in for six, hold for three, out for 12, because they have a bigger lung capacity than us. Oh. So depending on your athletic level or even your elevation is how long you're gonna hold and feel that breath. So kind of strange, when you breathe in, your heart rate actually accelerates by just a little teeny minuscule amount. And as you exhale, it slows your heart rate. So the longer you, your longer exhale slows it by more exponentially than the, the inhale. So kind of a strange little piece of science on that. But also when you're doing this breathing, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen documentaries on breath hold divers. So, I have not, but it scares me to hold my breath for that long. You know, that's surfing is my problem. I don't want to get held down because I'm afraid I might not be able to hold my breath. So. Yeah, and especially with surfing, your heart rate's already up. So then you're going to have a lot of trouble holding your breath because you're using all that oxygenated blood. So with a breath hold diver, if you watch, they'll sit on the edge of the boat and focus on slowing their heart rate because we have the ability to slow our own heart rates. With our breathing skills and managing it like that, you can sit and calm yourself down and slow that heart rate, which is how they're able to hold their breath for so long. Slide into the water, don't stress yourself, keep yourself calm. Same with public speaking. So you gotta get up there and figure out, okay, I've slowed my heart rate stay where I am, stay in this position. Wow, okay, so I had to give a, a big talk. I've done some public speaking myself and I remember the last one I did, it was long. I know you said you've done some like two and a half hour presentations and I think, I think mine, I thought it was three hours but I think it was two because it was 120 slides. No, is that three hours? Well, whatever, <laughs> no, that's two hours. I made a slide per minute, which was a little bit too much but I, was excited. I had this big ballroom. It was my first time speaking at this platform. And I all of a sudden couldn't get myself under control. I was just like shaking. I was breathing. My palms were sweating. And I I was able to get back to it, but I I I needed that technique of the the two second hold and then the exhale for longer. I think I was trying to hold for too long mm -hmm. and not exhale for long enough. And so I I got under control within the first couple of minutes of speaking, but I was like, oh my God, Chris, you got to get it together. You got to get, 
you got to get it together <laughs> in a hurry. So I like that. I wrote it down. The four, two, eight. Is that what it was? Yep. That's, that's my, uh, four, two, eight is my rhythm. Okay. I like yeah. it. So <clears throat> on the same front, like when we're talking about trying to get yourself under control, if you can't take that walk or you can't go get the exercise and let the breeze and the beauty and all that kind of stuff get you together, what can you do to try to take better care for yourself? Like, let's say it might be a hobby or a craft or something that you love. Like what, what, how can you help people find something that maybe they can get up and do something like cook? Let, let me make some brownies. Let me make <laughs> something that you love. You know, is there a certain recommendations to guide people? Yeah, I'm in Colorado, so there's a lot of brownie making. It's not in my house. <laughs> So here's kind of one of the things that I focus on. So I am an addictions counselor as well. So I run into a lot of people who have terrible coping skills. So alcohol, drugs, you know, gambling, whatever else it is. So what I do is I like to hone in and kind of look throughout people's past. What is it that you've done before that has helped you? What's been something that's interesting or fun? And um, I mean, it could be reading a book. Um, the most interesting example I have that I really enjoyed watching this guy get super into it was he got into building ships in a bottle. <laughs> Building ships. Ships, little little wooden ships in the bottle. So he was oh, very bottle. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's intricate. That's focused. Yep. Well, which he was uh struggling with alcoholism. So he's looking for something to do at night. And so that's a very intricate, involved uh, little hobby that he picked up. But I mean, it could be whatever else you might have been interested in. So that's that's where he went. And then some people built um, model cars in my class as well. So that was that was fun. But looking at yourself as a child. So as a child, I was a horseback rider. Um, I liked to build tree houses. I was a runner, uh, all that other kind of athletic and outdoorsy sort of things. So I tap into that myself. So horseback riding is my stress relief. It's great. It has uh, an exercise component to it. It also has kind of a outdoor component to it. It also has a little bit of alone time and that like platitude of quietness. But it also has a social component, especially with the type of writing I do. There's all sorts of people around. You have kind of a community that's created behind it. So most hobbies have something of this. Quilting, knitting, they even have like little social groups. So looking back through your childhood, what is it that you wished you had kind of harnessed but never did? Wow, for me, I wish I had spent more time with horses. And I know that uh, it's funny, I had a patient in California who came in I loved him. He was in his seventies. He hurt his back riding his gated horse. And you know, they're just really, <laughs> you know what I mean? A beautiful horse. I loved her, Dakota. David, if you're watching this, I still miss Dakota. But he <laughs> said, well, I said, I'm happy to help you. I don't know much about horses. I love them. And he goes, yeah, well, coming out, you can help, you know, clean her hooves and take her for a walk. So Dakota and I became friends and she was anxious actually in the turnout by herself. So I went in there with her and I, I give her a little treat, like some oats or something with molasses. And I would hold it behind me and I would have her chase me around. Mm -hmm. Now I just finished work and I had to drive up to Del Mar to go to take care of this horse. And I went every day and it was like, oh my gosh, I have one more thing to do. But when I got there, I was free. I had this horse, I brushed her, I cleaned her hooves. Sometimes I couldn't get her to lift them. But then yeah. like when I did, I was like, cleaning the hooves and then we walked around and had a good time. And that was better than any, my, I didn't even ride her. I did ride her a couple of times, but being with her and hanging out and focusing on that was the best meditation I think I've ever had. And he told me, and I think I mentioned this to you early that the reason why I felt that way was because the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a person. And for me, as a child, I had a, a visible horse in my shed that I would go take care of because I couldn't have access to horses. And as an adult, that's what I saw. I, I actually rescued a horse that somebody abandoned there. And it just made me feel so full and so much better in my life going forward the next day, the next week. Even still, when I think about it, I get filled up, you know? Yeah, exactly. Horses. So I don't actually know if you know that I'm an equine assisted psychotherapist. <laughs> you mentioned that, but what is that? So I, I used to work and uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll plug where I used to work, but uh, so yeah, I used to work with three horses, which is down in Lumber Bridge in North Carolina um, with, with a, my boss, Heather, she was great. Um, and so what it is, is it's basically an experiential therapy where it's unmounted. 
you are just in the pasture with the horses and horses are, I mean, I, I kind of feel like they're more of a reflection of your soul, but they're very reactive to your emotion. So doing therapy, there's a lot less speaking and a lot less letting kind of the horse do the therapy. But so have you ever seen, um, what was that movie with Sandra Bullock where she was 28 days, right? The addictions one. Oh my gosh, she couldn't lift the foot, lift the foot, lift the foot. <laughs> you, you mentioned the foot. And so horses are gonna be reactive to your emotion. And not only that, they're gonna remember what your emotion was last time they saw you. So if you come in the pasture and you're angry and you're stomping around and you're throwing their hay out and they're like gonna to react to that kind of emotion and feeling. And the next time you come back, they're going to be a little bit more hesitant about whether or not to trust you. So your, your emotions are a reflection in the animal. So it's a really cool form of therapy um, that works really well with trauma. So it's, it's fun to do. But divulging from that a little bit. So we look at the horse, but also we look at animals. So people who own animals have a significantly lower amount of stress and a lower amount of uh, uh, their heart rate is lower. So everything about them in their lifespan increases as well. <laughs> so you and your cats, you have done wonderful things <laughs> <laughs> to, to uh, make yourself be a healthier person. And I have my tank. My, so my horses are with my mom right now. And yeah. I have a horse left, Mr. Spider-Man. But uh, <laughs> My dog is with my husband at the moment and he is my, he's my baby. And so he definitely lowers our heart rate and makes our life better. I think it's amazing. You know, Di, my best friend said uh, that I was transformed when I found these wild kittens in the woods that one day. And I was stressed because I was working from Trumbull, Connecticut down to Stanford, just closer to New York City. And I had this big commute, stick shift. So it was only 24 miles. It's like what I commute right now to work, but it would take me like an hour and a half versus 25 minutes. And so now I had to go feed these things in the woods and I couldn't get them to come near me, but I felt compelled to take care of them. And she said, by the time I took them home, wild kittens, I was transformed. And it was <laughs> lovely to help them and to, you know, get them used to people and uh, get them to trust me. And it, it was transformative. She did say that you're transformed. And what you're saying, I didn't know those facts about living longer. I know they bring us joy. I love all animals. I would take them all if I had a big farm, but you yeah, don't. And I won't, but you probably will. Yeah. I'll have one soon and you can come bring them there. <laughs> we call the pandemic puppy. I will come visit the pandemic puppy because many people, it was good for pets on the island here because people were adopting puppies. They were adopting abandoned cats. They were doing all kinds of things with pets. And I, that's lovely. That's why. You know what it gives you? And I think this is interesting too, because it links back into your stress reduction skills here is it gives you purpose. So having something else that you are required to take care of that needs you, that leans on you, that is yours, um, gives you a purpose. And that feeling of purpose gives you a feeling of fulfillment. So the feeling of fulfillment going to stress reduction, that's what you're looking to tap into. So we have actually two different types of stress. We have a beneficial stress and a negative stress. So if you're worrying about something all the time that you can't do anything about, uh, I mean, the weather or you know the height of the trees in your neighbor's backyard, whatever it is, and it's just something that's driving you crazy, that's your detrimental worry. That is something that is causing you to be unhealthy. It actually causes the higher cortisol levels, causes weight gain, and it causes memory loss, earlier onset of dementia, I even believe is part of that. So looking at this negative form of stress, that's the type that you're trying to combat with your cats and your horses and whatever else it is that we have. But then there is positive stress. So can you think of some like, crazy examples of positive stress? Um, well, I think positive stress is like giving that public speaking talk or like how I feel before I get on the air here for Think Tech Hawaii is uh, I'm nervous, I'm stressed. Um, maybe getting nervous before you're about to have a baby or you know, someone's proposing to you and you're gonna say yes and you're stressed and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, like those <laughs> kind of stresses, right? Is The baby's a good one. And you know what else is a really simple one that nobody thinks about? What about sports induced stress? Oh. So you're competitive, you're about to be in a game and you know that feeling. So I know you've run a lot of races. You and I, are, we like our races yes, <laughs> and volleyball too. So yeah. like you're about to start the game or you're about to start the race and you're there at the start line. You're like, Whoo. you can feel that you can feel it run through your body. Yeah, so yeah. that is a, yeah, it's a great feeling. It's like that course of adrenaline and yeah. it makes you physically stronger. So when you actually get that feeling of that adrenaline going, it's that first burst, that is a positive form of stress. So it is, it is still stress, 
but it's a good thing for your body. It's going to make you run faster, run harder, jump higher. And it lasts only a short period of time. You get that burnout. So it's that initial like push on the sprint, but then you level out, right? Yeah. That, and you need to level out, right? Otherwise you fall apart on the, on the, in the race. You have to like get that surge and then go into the focus mode or something. Is that right? Yep. So harnessing your positive stress with some deep breathing. <laughs> well, I like that. I like that. So we have a question. How can I help someone who's in denial that they're stressed? That's a great question. Hmm. So God, I'd love to hear more about what the denial that they're in stress is. Cause frequently what happens is, um, people get caught. Um, so we call it wound around your own axle, right? So you, oh, you, I love that. you there's, there's the Southerner and me coming out. <laughs> You can't see beyond your peripheral vision here. So you have the feeling of, um, I'm not stressed. I'm just really busy. Uh, I'm not stressed. I'm just disorganized or I'm not stressed. I just have, you know, six kids and whatever else it is. Yeah, yeah. So the best thing you can do there is be the support system. So trying to convince somebody that they're stressed is never going to work. It's just going to make them resentful towards you and become um, distant. So frequently what happens is if you can just engage and find a way to help them with some of these stress management skills we're talking about. So if, if it's a good friend, um, maybe even say like, I'm stressed. Could you yeah. go for a walk with me and take a little bit of time with me? And then you can have the chance to integrate in some of these skills with them. But the it's only going to work against you to try and convince somebody of the problems that you can see. They have to come to fruition and see it themselves. And the, the kind of trying to put yourself in there is going to make it worse. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really great advice. I like that. I mean, it's with the kids things too. Like if it was one of my friends that was stressed, but in denial that they were stressed and they had a bunch of kids, I could offer say, Hey, why don't we take the kids to the park? And then we could hang out and get like adult time and chat about, whatever make jokes while we're with the kids you know what i mean would that be something that could be helpful without calling out their stress but bringing them outside and helping with the kids maybe for a day or yeah and sometimes shouldering somebody's burden for just a little bit and not to the point of enabling so dear god don't don't take me in that direction where we're going to take everybody's problems on but allowing them to have a little bit of insight so i've got a friend uh, she'll probably watch this later and, and will laugh at me so i've got a friend back in colorado who has four kids and she frequently gets very stressed she also has um some has really terrible back pain so oh. just, just a couple of months ago um, i said give me all of your children just drop them off so, so I had all the kids for the afternoon and just let her go and do whatever you want to do. And people need to have that little bit of space for themselves. And if you can't find a way to take it, it feels like you're drowning. And uh, it's, it's like, um, so stress is a, there's a funny little way that somebody described it once. Imagine that you have a child and you're, you're in the ocean and you're swimming with the child with no life jacket. That's, that's a horrible feeling. You know, you're doing the egg beater kick, trying to hold up the kid, hold up the kid. And then stress comes and you know what stress is? Somebody hands you another kid. <laughs> so then you're like, ah. So that's what these people are feeling. I'm mean, not just with kids, but just the concept of stress in general. So recognizing that you have to figure out a way, like, God, somebody give me a dock or like a buoy. So if you want to be the buoy for somebody for the day, it really does help them open their eyes to see what it feels like to not be stressed. And that's a key component of like, okay, if this is what normalcy feels like, like it feels okay to not be stressed. Oh my gosh, what was going on in my life before? I like, you're a good friend. I like that example. So, so we have four minutes left and I want to circle back just for a second to the, to the animals and stress relief. Cause I know there's some people because I've had friends who are allergic to animals and can't have them in their life or, or really don't like them or <laughs> afraid of them. And I, I want to call up, uh, picture number two, because I think that having something as simple as just a flower that you like to look at or a family member that's dear to you that would bring you, evoke an emotion. And in picture number three, there's a couple in the background. And when I see the flowers in the beach and the couple, I think, oh, they're in love. Now that won't have the same emotion for everybody, but it does evoke a very positive, warm and fuzzy feeling for me. And so I often, in my room, I have a picture of plumeria flowers. I have footsteps of two people on the beach that my dad and I used to 
to look at and that evokes a sense of warmth and joy for me. Do you have, we have two minutes left now, but do you have any other, I'm sure you have a wealth of things, any other tips for people if they just, they just don't know what to do, but maybe a photo or something like that could help them. Find your happy place, right? So you can have either a picture or you can have it in your mind. So something that you draw upon that makes you feel that calm, a vacation from a childhood that doesn't have any sort of negative memories attached to it. Just even a smell you can think of in your head that brings back, you know, the ocean or grandmother's cookies or a feeling and time in your life where you felt safe and calm. And then use your deep breathing and focus on those feelings and that emotion to hold it, hold that emotion and let the negative emotions fly through. So breathe in good intentions and out negativity. Well, that is wonderful. So uh, Devin, thank you so much for joining us here on Movement Matters. And thank you, Think Tech Hawaii and all our sponsors and donors for allowing us to be here with you today. We'll see you again in two weeks. Life is better when you listen to your physical therapist. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>